All right, guys, what's up? We're live for episode 40 of the Playing to Win series. Uh, this will be a fun one today. We've got uh, below me, George Gammon. Uh, to my <laughs> left, I don't know. These things are reversed with the cameras. <laughs> Aaron Cleary, of course, you guys know Captain Capitalism. And if you're unfamiliar with Rolo Tomasi, you've been living under a rock somewhere. Why so, are you watching this show? <laughs> <laughs> How's everybody doing today? Good, good, good. Awesome. Doing very well, guys. Again, yeah. thanks for uh, having me here. It's really an honor. Yeah, so a little bit of background. Um, Rolo kind of cooked up this idea. He said, you know, I have went down to this Rebel Capitalist Conference, which George uh, hosted in Miami the other month, and uh, he said, you know, we should all get together and talk about the economics of the Red Pill and how it applies to other areas of life, um, topic that I'm fond of. So <laughs> Rolo's got a bunch of questions for us, and sure. he's going to help guide us through these uh through this labyrinth, if you will. So, you so, take it off um, so let me let me start out by saying that uh, Aaron and I have had this conversation before. We did, Correct, a, we did, we did things, a couple. Yeah. Of, I think we did at least two different episodes on my show, or maybe we did one on your show. I'm not really sure where we've talked about. Um, the we economic. talked about the economics of prostitution. Is one of yeah, them. That was one. <laughs> You're talking about OnlyFans, then, obviously. Yeah. yeah well, no, I mean, marriage is what I was talking about. Marriage. That's it. Okay. That's yeah, marriage. But that's that's interesting. You should bring that up, Rich, because that's actually uh, one of the questions I have on this list. Yeah. So, uh, so just a little bit of uh, you know full disclosure here. Aaron and I have talked about this before. Uh, George Gammon and myself have actually talked about a lot of this stuff to, to, as well on George's channel. And then, Rich, I think you and I. I have probably talked about this a few times actually on this show yeah. but we've never had everybody kind of all together so uh, before i you know just to give a little bit of, uh, of preface here the reason why i wanted to bring everybody together here and i'd really like to get ken mcelroy and even possibly robert kiyosaki at some time in the future um to discuss these things is because when i was at the rebel capitalist uh conference which was in miami at the beginning of june um it was sort of an eye-opening experience for me. I, I did not realize there was that much crossover between uh, our sort of spheres with uh, George's sphere. And, uh, you know, talking with Robert Kiyosaki, talking with the other guys who are speakers there, uh, Ken McElroy amongst them, um, really impressed upon me the need to um, sort of explore this side of not only the red pill, but also uh, I, I don't even know really what to call it, George. I mean, is it like the, the libertarian economic side, like the, the rebel capitalist side, I guess, of, of your sphere? Um, and so I wanted to sort of open a discourse between all of us. Now, Rich, I'm familiar with, obviously, uh, Joel, all, everybody here I'm, I'm familiar with, but um, there's going to be people along the way who I, I think are in your um I guess, sphere, George, uh, who are kind of peripherally aware of the red pill and um, like they know me and they might have heard of Rich. Uh, they might not necessarily know who Aaron is. Uh, Aaron's a, you want to give him a little bit of background, Aaron? Because I'm not really sure that George really knows your background. Yeah, a real quick background. Uh, backgrounds in finance and economics uh, degree and all that and banking uh, analyst and uh, but wrote a book on the housing crisis, also been blogging since 2004, which has since led me down this path to become blogger, podcaster, content creator in general. Yeah. And my expertise as that has evolved, has uh, basically come to the intersection between, uh, for lack of better words, sex, love, marriage, uh, the dynamics between the sexes and economics. Hmm. And so that's kind of where I come in. So I do financial advice, planning, forecasting, but then also as it pertains to uh, the human psyche. So not not so much a, a quantitative analyst, but more heavily uh, introducing psychology, incentives, human instinct, and how to basically avoid huge mistakes that come from not thinking and feelings. That's kind of the realm I'm in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, I think I was speaking down in Belize a, a couple weeks ago, and that was kind of the main topic that I was trying to impress upon the people that were there the attendees is I think now more than ever, you've got to know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, before I retired, that was uh, one thing that uh, a business mentor of mine uh, would always say. And it sounds so simple, but once you really think it through, you realize how profound it is. And with what's happening right now in the economy, what, what's happening with the, the red pill, what's happening to young males, especially right now, 
uh, and and females, I think is going to have a really uh, profound impact. And just assuming that we understand everything, even in this group, I think is a mistake. So if you're always trying to figure out what you don't know and further seek truth, I think financially, which is I think a big opponent of being alpha and being independent, uh, financially, you're gonna have a big edge. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, George, you also had uh, one of the things that I um, actually use as reference for today's questions here is uh, the uh, episode you did on will the housing market crash or will it you know, continue on as to like right now, the housing market is at above where it was in 2007 as far as yeah. like, overinflation of it right now. And yeah. you had and, and you do a whiteboard kind of video. And uh, one, I think it was like the, the fourth one along the way was uh, you introduced the word hypergamy to um, to your audience, which I think was sort of uh, something that was uh, maybe it's fresh to your audience, but to, to us, obviously, I mean, I mean gosh, I, I'm synony- Roll Tomasi is synonymous with hypergamy, right? Um, but um, can you give us just a little quick breakdown of that? Because that's going to lead us into um, the marriage topic that I had here. So like, what, what exactly were you talking about in that, that particular bullet point um, with respect to how family formation and how marriage and how hypergamy sort of affect the, the, the housing market? Because like, as far as like, you know, family, single families buying, buying homes right now, as opposed to renting homes, as opposed to even forming families in the first place. So can you give just like a really brief rundown of what that was all about? Yeah. I mean, it's not just the housing markets. It's, it's the economy more broadly. They, they've got a saying in economics that uh, demographics equal destiny. And so if you've got an environment where women are, let's say, doing better economically, and, w- and we all know that women are going to choose a, a long-term uh, boyfriend or husband based on uh, hypergamy, meaning that they're going to date sideways and up. So if they're climbing the socioeconomic ladder, that just means that there's going to be fewer and fewer men that are uh, acceptable to them. And, uh, you know, like Rich says, it's not good. It's not bad. It just it just is. It is what it is. So that means that, uh, you know, Pareto distribution, if it was, uh, you know, 20 percent of the guys getting 80 percent of the women uh, a couple decades ago, I think over the next this could happen quickly, two, three, five years, that's going to go to about, uh, you know, five percent of the guys. And there's going to be a larger pool of women that are seeking those individuals. But what that also means is there's gonna be a larger percentage of males that are just completely out of the picture. Like they, they subconsciously, they realize that they have zero chance of, um, of uh, you know, passing on their DNA. And mm-hmm. I think you get evolutional. Uh, that's where, you know, a lot of the drive comes from. So you have a, a, a setup where you've got fewer and fewer kids being produced, being born. So you have uh, you know fewer people, which would have the opposite effect of the baby boomers. You know, we always hear how that was a big boom for the economy because you had this huge glut of people coming into their spending years and doing all these things and driving up asset prices and driving up home prices and consuming. And if you have an economy that's 70% consumption, that's a good thing for economic growth. Uh, but now if you've got fewer and fewer and fewer children being born, you know, that's a bad thing for now, but it's a really bad thing for 15, uh, 20 years down the line. Mm-hmm. So that's, but again, my point there is it's not just with housing, those demographic issues uh, bleed through the entire economy. Mm-hmm. Now, Aaron, uh, you and I have discussed the, um, I think, of, and I actually put this in my fourth book, is the uh, the article by um, Morgan Stanley, The Rise of the She Economy. Yeah. And um, how, and are you from, uh, Aaron, what were the numbers on that? Do you remember? I keep, I keep going for it because I'm so, I have don't, so many statistics and numbers in my previous book, they blur <laughs> together. Uh, yeah, but it, come on. <laughs> it, it was something like between 18 and 50. Or 25 and 50 working age women. I'm working age women between 20 right, whatever, and yeah. four. You know. And roughly half or 45% were going to be single and childless mm-hmm. or, yeah. or without children. So by, it, it, by 2030, yeah. yeah. By 2030, yeah. So uh, don't quote me on those numbers, but a shockingly high percentage of women in their working age years will have never married or had children. 
Mm -hmm. And so, and, and this is, this is something that, you know, a, a company like Morgan Stanley is already predicting and using to forecast for investments for, uh, I mean, they're, if they're at least certain enough to have put out a, a very detailed after the fact, I think it's actually part of the blog now, um, what you can do to sort of like plan ahead and like, I don't know, invest in cat food and box wine or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> to, for the future. Now, my question is, so first question is this is why do you think that is? Why do you think that 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 demographic by I mean, within the next, let's say, nine years is going to be that significant at this stage? And you're asking me? Yeah. Anyway. Because they were told because they were told to. I, I've, told I've been wrestled with a with the human theory, like how susceptible are people to brainwashing indoctrination? And I would say the vast majority are completely susceptible to it because I've seen it. I've, I've just seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the longest time, young women, gr girls starting at five, Lord knows even now with pre-K and, and, and you know, there's the book out called Feminist Baby. Uh, the, I know going back to 1980 when I was just a little, little runt, uh, it was already there. Yes, we knew women didn't need us. Yes, we knew girls could do everything else. Uh, and that has not only maintained itself, uh, but it's been turned up to 15, 20, 25 exponentially. Uh, and I've witnessed it. I've seen it. Uh, young women, or maybe not so young women anymore, are responding to what they were told to do. This is right. This is what you should do. Uh, to a larger extent, uh, you don't need a man. Uh, may, they may would like to have one, but they don't need one. And that's maybe they don't believe it, but they act on it. And you can see this in their actions and their behaviors. They are postponing marriage. They are postponing children. Uh, and in the research for, for my book, I went through some polling data and where young women and not so young women prioritize things in their life. Marriage and children, depending on their age, was not in the top three, sometimes mm -hmm. not in the top two if they got a little bit older. Mm -hmm. um, and this just kicks family formation, children, marriage uh, down the road. And what the, has been replaced with men instead, where mm -hmm. love and, and uh, husband and children uh, has been career and self-actualization. And I would also say uh, politics to a large regard or some kind of I wouldn't call it a substitute for religion, not necessarily Christianity or Islam or Judaism or something like that, but feminism, environmentalism, uh, making change, you know, this um, existential, yeah, existential. Uh, yeah, and a substitute for agency where it's like, okay, your career is there, but what are you doing on the side? Well, I'm uh, dog rescue would be another perfect example. Uh, it kind of runs the gambit. Um, but that's, that's why, and they're doing what they were told. Uh, very much like us young men, we did what we were, we were nice guys. We, you know, we just, we did what we were told. We're just the ones that seem to be waking up right now. So that's, that's why, I, uh, why I think that's happening. Rich, why do you think, why do you think women are going to be single uh, and childless? Um, let's, at least half, let's just say within the next nine years. Well, to add to what Aaron's already listed there, which I co-sign, um, top shelf men are starting to avoid insufferable women. You know, they're starting to realize that the juice ain't worth the squeeze. Um, it's not worth exposing themselves and their wealth to huge amounts of risk to hashtag boss girls that are, you know, going to make their life difficult after they've been chasing excellence all day long. They come home and, you know, get browbeaten sort of thing. Um, there's not a lot of uh, incentive anymore to having families and children. I mean, if you look at this, you know, the stats and the way that things have changed and the fabric of, uh, you know, the nuclear families changed over the uh, century. Mm -hmm. So um, that leaves a lot of, you know, women out to pasture to climb the corporate ladder, you know, collect cats and box wine subscriptions and, um, you know, go globalism, feminism and all the other isms and big daddy states, you know, their favorite lover now. Mm -hmm. George, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, if you go through and do the math on uh, what most women's expectations are, what, what their, um, I don't want to say objectives, but I guess for lack of a better word, we'll say objectives in trying to find a long-term relationship or a husband. You know, they'll list all of these things. Well, the guy's got to be straight. Okay. He's got to be between this age group. He, uh, ideally, he'd make this amount of money. He's got to be a leader of men. He's got to pursue excellence. He has to do all these things, you know. And um, then you go through and say, okay, well, let, let's just assume that you live in a, a town of a million people. 
And then you go through and you say, okay, well, how many men are there in this million people? Okay, there's 500,000. Well, how many fall into this age group? Okay, well, now maybe you've got uh, 20,000. And how many of those guys are, are, you know, fit all these other categories? What it boils down to is like five or six, you know, and, that, that's what all, and that's what all the gals want because, again, it goes back to hypergamy. When they're increasing their socioeconomic uh, level, you know, and the guys aren't doing it, at the same pace, then there's going to be fewer and fewer and fewer options that fit their checklist of uh, what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just, it is what it is. And it's, uh, you know, women can say that's right, wrong. Guys can get pissed off about it. But um, I, I think that the powerful message for guys and women is that if guys just go out and do what Rich talks about, you know, it, it, it's, it's, if you just pursue excellence and you do not pursue women, uh, you're, you're going to have the best of both worlds. And the woman, whatever woman you choose to be a part of your life is going to have a much, much, much better experience. And the relationship overall is going to be much better because at the end of the day, you guys know as well as I do that women, um, they say they can say whatever, but it, they, they, they want a guy that's, you know, not an asshole or not a prick or anything like that, but a guy that can really take charge and someone that isn't afraid to make a decision and someone that is decisive, someone that's a leader of men and uh, someone that has a high degree of competency and ambition. You know, this is what really uh, women respect in men. And I think that once, um, you know, a lot of guys fall into the trap, they get married and they think that they don't have to worry about it anymore Mm -hmm. because it's till death do us part. So I don't have to go to the gym. I don't have to continue to grow my business. I don't have to continue to, you know, achieve a hundred percent of my God given potential. And then once the, 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 the gal sees that, you know, mm-hmm. subconsciously, that's the biggest turnoff ever. And, um, you know, you guys know where it goes from there. So my whole point with the layering over economics is just to point out that I, I think this trend will continue. And although JP Morgan might have been looking at it from standpoint of consumption, like consumer goods, mm-hmm. what, what are they going to consume more? I would look at it from a standpoint of uh, demographics having uh, a real population problem. And in a world and in an economy where you always have to continue to create more debt and more dollars, if you have a decreasing population, that's a big problem. And then what happens is the government steps in and tries to counter uh, act that with, uh, we'll call it printing money for lack of a better term. And then you have more money being created, but you have fewer goods and services. And at the end of the day, the wealth of the economy is a measurement of the goods and services it can produce efficiently. You know, I, I use the example at the time if you were on a deserted island and you had a, a billion dollars in a chest, you know, would you be rich or poor? Uh, you'd be poor because there's nothing to buy. So the, the amount of dollars in the system doesn't matter. And this takes us to UBI. You know, I think that the, the part of the problem here is the welfare state if you go back because it's allowed women to make decisions that they otherwise wouldn't make. And again, you can say that's good, but you got to look at the cost benefit analysis. It's not just the benefit. There's also a cost involved in any decision where you're dealing with uh, economics, which is really defined by the allocation of scarce resources with alternative uses. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that it, it, it's it's more than just, you know, buying certain things and not buying other things because women are more control over the majority of money being spent. I think it's the, the fact that this produces an environment where the, uh, the, the free market isn't working at full capacity because so many men have been eliminated out of the system. And then you go and combine that with the fact that most of these young uh, boys, you know, that are the future entrepreneurs as well as the women, but you know, the guys really getting out there and hustling and driving the economy forward. It's always that top 1% of producers. You know, I think Rich knows that well. And now we're in an environment because of the welfare state where the majority of those young men who are, are extremely talented and the young women, but I think this inversely affects men more. They're raised in a single family you know, or a single mother household. And then when they go to school, 95% of the teachers are female. Mm-hmm. So then they grow up in that environment 
And I think that, you know, what does that do to society at large as far as our ability to start businesses, to take risk, to, to be leaders, to go out there and solve problems, to be ambitious, to, to create goods and services and compete at a global level. I think it decreases our ability to do that. And the government fills the gap with money printing, which uh, most likely creates consumer price inflation, which I'll save for later in the discussion because that's what we can go over things that the viewers right now can do to actually protect themselves and maybe uh, build wealth and thrive in kind of this crazy environment that we're moving into. Yeah. Just well, to, if, if just I to might. top up on what George was saying there, I just want to add this because, Amelia, this is probably the first time in history ever where we essentially have a gigafactory that makes betas on such a large <laughs> level, yeah. right? Like there's a lot of men today that aren't even involved with women, period. All right. Yeah, I was going to say is like there's it's not just like guys getting into a marriage and then sort of giving up. It's guys giving up on marriage altogether. Guys right. giving up on women and then yeah, they're like giving up on women, up not on even on marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And once a guy yeah. subconsciously, uh, subconsciously gives up hope that they can pass on their DNA, that's a, that's not that's a powder keg right All there. Would reason. you got? Well, can I destroy some hope? Then. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Just destroy some hope, Aaron. <laughs> I, I'm going to destroy. So if, if there was any remaining. Mm -hmm. uh, but what George was saying, his primary concern is that obviously humans are the source of all economic production as our population shrinks. It has bad tidings for the future economy. But to put some numbers on, this is why I put together. This is really just an actuarial study. And this is the best statistics I could come up with um, to show you how little demand there is on the side of women interested in the average guy. And that's what this I had to assume oh. a type of guy of stereotype. Just your average guy of five and assumptions and all that made only 2.9 percent of women are really interested in your average guy. Right, uh, right. They are more interested in careers, the other things that we've talked about, also sexual attraction as well, if you throw that in there as well. And you have to think about what just a, a, a small eye of a needle that puts the future of this particular population uh, through. Like only less than 5% of the women out there are willing to uh, commit, get with, form families with the average guy. And George is right. That's going to have a horrific effect on the future economic production of the United States, or let alone any other country with very low birth rates. And if you think birth rates are low now, just wait. I think it's the the uh, first derivative is going to accelerate uh, the marriage rates, uh, procreation rates, fertility rates, and things like that. But it's already bad now for girls between 18 and 35. And, and going forward, I can't imagine it being uh, uh, much better. But there is very little demand uh, for the average guy out there. And then, I don't know, there's this, hang on, let me see, I got it here somewhere. And social media me. exacerbates that problem. Right, there's right. You guys Absolutely. talked about many times. But but in order to in order to even be in the procreation game, you maybe you should read this book. I don't know. Maybe you want to read that book. How, but you really got to be in a top elite class. Uh, so yeah, this is definitely throwing a, a monkey into the uh, reproductivity, uh, a monkey wrench in the reproductivity machine, and and by association by consequence, the economy in the future. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, I mean, the solution, if you're to able just to wave a magic wand is for women's standards to, to, to lower or for, or for men to get that much better. And I, I don't see either of those happening nope. uh, right now. Especially on, a, on, an evolutionary, on an evolutionary scale, women are not going to give that up. That's simply no. like women look for quality. They don't look for like men are looking for quality, quantity. Men, women look for quality. Yeah. And so yeah. when that quality is paired with economic attractiveness, like remember those uh, was it as far back as like 2018, 2019. Uh, I was doing uh, shows with Pat Campbell back then. We were talking about the uh, the, the research findings, I guess that um, that showed that you know women were not finding guys economically attractive, and that's actually one of the things that I've got on here is is um, is the fact that um, that the idea of like say love or family formation or marriages for you know for however you want to you want to pair this up um, when women are making more money than men. That is something that is like on an evolutionary level, on an innate level, on an instinctual level. It's hard for women to accept that. 
regardless of, I mean, unless the guy has something that is really uh, like a 10 inch personality and is really yoked and really like satisfies that kind of alpha seed side of hypergamy, there's going to be problems. Um, so when women get uh, are in the workforce and uh, even if a, a couple starts out making exactly the same amount of money, if that woman gets a, a, a bonus or she gets a raise or she gets a promotion of some sorts, that is a precipitator of a divorce right there. And because women are looking for a guy who makes more money than them, who has higher value than them, and that higher value takes the form of a lot of different things. And primarily today in a transactional nature, it's, it's, it's money, it's economics, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why women are going to be more lonely and, and without, without children and without marriage. And I think that right now we're kind of looking at a way of justifying that because we know it's coming down the road. So we start looking into alternative relationship styles. Well, we look at the marriage rate right now, and this is where I wanted to go with this. This is my first, uh, my first question for you guys is, you know, can we save marriage? Right now, traditional... Con, you know, conventional marriage between a man and a woman is uh, is in the tank. We are at its lowest percentage that it has ever been at since they started keeping records for this. It was like six and a half or six point one percent per one thousand. And the age of first marriage in the United States, anyways, keeps getting pushed back further and further. Right now, it's twenty nine point eight for men and twenty eight point seven, I believe, for women. And in the UK, it's even pushed back further than that. So, my question to to everybody here is: Is can you save marriage? Is that it, like is there any way to do that? Considering that, like, because none of you guys, as far I'm, I'm pretty sure George isn't married. I'm the only guy that's married on this entire panel right here. I know Rich has been married before, and I know I've asked this of, of uh, well, I, certainly Rich before. It's like, would you ever get married again? I'm sure he's going to say no or hell no. That's still a hell no, yeah. Yeah, okay. One of those, one of those two is going to come up, and I know George is not married, and I'm very certain that Aaron, although he has a, I believe you have a long-term girlfriend, um, is not married at all. Um, and it's to you guys, it is not even a consideration at this point. Um, you know, people want to say, well, you got a unicorn, you got lucky Rolo. Well, okay. But, uh, and I've said this in the past, it's like, if I found myself single tomorrow or I widowed or divorced or whatever, I would not ever want to get married again, simply because I understand the state of marriage and what it's about right now. Um, so that said, we're looking at fertility rates that are in the tank. We're looking at, well, divorce rates are down because marriage rates are down <laughs> and um, marriage rates are at their lowest right now. Um, we're, pushing it, we're pushing back uh, the age of first marriage further and further and further. Is there, should we save marriage? That's a, maybe that's the question I should be asking. Should we save marriage? Should there be something? Is there any kind of fix to this? Um, I'll go first if you guys okay, want to yeah. let me hop on the soapbox here for a bit because I've, I've put a lot of thought in this. I have an entire chapter in my book on why smart men don't marry today. Um, should okay to answer the question: Should we save it? Save it for what? You know, for who? Is it worth saving? Yeah. Well, not for men. Absolutely not. I mean, there's it, it's it's all uh, risk with low with very low reward for men, and it's low risk and higher reward for women. Um, the, the social contract of marriage, like the origins of marriage for a very long time, if you read Stephanie Kuntz's book, um, The History of Marriage, it was about the acquisition of in-laws. And even if there was a breakup in that relationship a few hundred years ago, and she brought a few acres of land to the table and I don't know, a couple of cows or something like that, um, he would usually keep the kids and all the assets that were acquired during the, you know, merging of the families. And she would often go and live with her family or in some cases have to go and work in a brothel. Um, but that's changed completely. Um, that entire scenario has been flipped upside down and then smashed into the ground with a big sledgehammer. Uh, it's been beaten dead. There's, there's really very few advantages to marriage, um, you know, for men today. And then you, mix into that equation. So if you take a blender and you take that ingredient, you throw that into the blender and then you take, well, most men today are weaker betas. They don't know how to hold frame in a relationship. Mm -hmm. They're not red pill aware. Uh, almost all guys will go through the process of betatization through a thousand concessions. Let's throw in that ingredient. Um, if she decides to pull the plug from 
underneath you in a marriage and wants to get a divorce, the state will make sure that she's well looked after and there's a transfer of your resources. You probably won't see your kids as much as you used to. Some other guy that she starts porking will see your kids a lot more than you do. Throw that in the blender. And then you turn on the blender and you blend it up and you have yourself a nice big shit shake. There's really nothing in there to try to save. Um, if, if society wants to save marriage, th this is what needs to happen. I'll say it again. Women need to take off the pink pussy hats. They need to all get together and say, you know what? We want to get married. We like the idea of marriage, um, religious, you know, whatever, insert reason here. But it's too hostile towards men and they're not marrying us. So we want the state to change those laws to make them more balanced. Not even fair, but like more balanced. Mm -hmm. But I don't see that happening. Like why would women want to give up the advantage that they have when there's so many gullible men lining up to wife up all of these women today. Mm -hmm. right. So, you know, to answer the question of, is it worth saving? I mean, if you've got a functioning brain in your head and you've watched any of my content for a little bit, it's hard to conclude that it's worth saving. Mm -hmm. Aaron, do you, why aren't you married, Aaron? Oh, my old man's <laughs> been divorced 18, 19, 20. I don't know. And then see my friends get divorced. I don't know. Do you want, do you want to go dance on landmines? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I'll tell you why uh, legally that is a hard no that the legal risk facing men and maybe even women sometimes is it's not worth the government's way too involved. No. So that's, that's a deal breaker off that. And I even wrote these down and there, let me count the ways I'll just give you the main ones Two, men can't afford it. Young men can't afford it in part because we've regulated the heck out of the economy. We tax their ever living snot out of productive men. I mean, we all women want a guy that makes six figs. Well, you know, men would have the same purchasing power if they weren't forking over 45% of their income at 67,000 a year. So uh, young men- 53% here, my friend. Well, well that's because you're in, you have that nice long haired trust fund baby as a president. Um, <laughs> <laughs> women don't want to, as per our previous conversations, they have reprioritized career and, and, and things above that. Um, and I'll, I'll be perfectly blunt. Honest, most women are not, I hate to use the word trained, but prepared or conditioned or educated about what it's like to be a quality wife. They all want to get married. They all want to have kids. But the heck, if any of them want to be a wife or a mother, I mean, it's, oh, Kid came off the assembly line, ship it to daycare. Mama got to go work. And he bet at this, he bet at that. It's like, hey, selflessness, altruism. I love you more than you love me. I give him advice. That, that is, I've said it many times before, at best, young women have been conditioned to be adversarial, I'm sorry, competitive against men, and at worst, adversarial. They are very, go read it. I <laughs> didn't pull it out of my ass. There are very, few marriageable women. There are very few young women today who are even capable of a serious and mature relationship such as marriage. Uh, so there's that. And then as to whether marriage is worth saving, right? No, not its current condition. It's not marriage. This is a, this is a very convoluted tax. This is a very convoluted wealth transfer scheme. Um, it, it, and we haven't even talked about how horrific it is for children. Uh, but it will, it will inevitably form. It formed naturally throughout human history, uh, but it's just going to take a genuine economic collapse. It's going to take an elimination of, of law. Like, a, a, like it's going to have to happen that bad. This women are going to sit down and say, okay, okay, well, all right, we've gone. No, it's not going to happen. It's going to be like, where's the water? Holy crap. Where's, the, where's the electricity? And then we're going to go back to reset. We're going to go through everything humanity had to learn going all the way back to the Mesopotamians say, Hey, you know what? We should come up with an agreement, a social contract. And we're going to reformulate the exact same rules that we did before. Uh, and maybe we'll do it all again in the year 4,500 AD, but it, it will, if the human race wish, wishes to continue and grow economically beyond, beyond a, a subsistence farming type of existence, it will return, but we are going to have to have this entire system collapse. People are going to have to have their nose put into reality as to what it takes to survive and support a family uh, without the assistance of government. Um, until that happens, it, no, there is no reason men should get married. There's no reason women should get married. And there's no reason to salvage this Frankenstein version of, of marriage that we have today. Mm -hmm. George, what do you think about this? Yeah. I like the reason I'm at one, before you answer, let me just give you a little food for thought here. 
when I was watching your whiteboard thing about, you know, the housing market and forming families and, and the idea of like these families who would have to be, would be predicated, let's just say, on a conventional form of marriage is affecting the housing market or affecting people's like certainly their buying power and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it worthwhile for us to even like consider like trying to find some way to sort of sell like salvage marriage maybe not maybe save is not the word <laughs> like maybe reimagine <laughs> reimagine it or 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 put it into a different context would that be of value from an economic perspective well you know i don't know how even if it was i don't know how you'd execute you know because then it goes back to central planning and we definitely don't want any more central planning than we already have especially in the United States and, and, and Canada, you know, how, how do you make that a loss? It's got to be a bottoms up. It's got to be something that men and women uh, both understand and, and want to pursue. Uh, even if it's not marriage, even if it's just a long-term relationship where two parties are committed to each other and want to start and raise and grow a family, you know, whatever you want to call that. Uh, but the, it, it needs to, there needs to be awareness on both sides uh, as to what the issue is and then come to some sort of common ground by changing the law or the incentive structure in order for us to, you know, not just have marriage into the future, but have, have uh, a growing society from a standpoint of population. And that that's healthy. So um, it's just, it's, it's getting from A to B is, is difficult because of the narratives right now that are being pushed so heavily uh, in society and because we as human beings struggle when it comes to doing a cost benefit analysis on uh, things like, you know, let's use an, as an example, a gal that wants to become a professional and climb the corporate ladder. Fantastic. That, that, that's, that's great. I'm all for it. But they need to understand the, the, the cost of doing that. And so few uh, of them do because society will say, oh, well, you can have it all. You can have everything. Well, actually, you really can't have everything. Uh, guys can't have everything. Women can't have everything. So you have to make choices. You have to understand that if you pursue this career, uh, you might not be able to have as many kids. And it just it is what it is, you know, but you have to be conscious that you're making those decisions. And I think, uh, you know, either neither party is really conscious of, of what's going on. But one thing I, I wanted to uh, say, you know, Aaron was talking about uh, or alluding to now we need two um, income families. And I think that's a, a big part of this. You know, uh, if we didn't need two income families, uh, this uh, family unit, I think, would be much more uh, easy to maintain. And also, too, you know, if you look at Jordan Peterson's work, which I'm sure you guys, I know you guys have, because I heard you talk about it, on Sweden, as an example, when you get societies that are the most egalitarian, you find that left to their own devices, women usually uh, take on roles that you would assume historically that they would take on and pursue things that they historically have been interested in and same thing with guys. So if we can just get out of the way and leave people to their own devices, then I think that there's a, a, a brighter future. But going back to the, the two income family, you know, most people don't realize that when the Fed was created in 1913, and this is the, the Federal Reserve, uh, the, the U.S., uh, you know, reserve bank or central bank. And um, since then, the dollar has lost about 95, 97% of its value. Uh, so wh what does that mean? That means that let's say we have a 2% compounded inflation rate or a 3%, meaning the price of the stuff that you buy is going up at 3% compounded per year. Okay, well, that's a big problem. Because if you're just in the past, if you were able to just put your money, your dollars in the bank and that maintained its purchasing power, well, that means that, that, that money over time increases in value. And therefore, if you're saving money doing the prudent thing, you're going to get ahead in life and you're going to get to a point where there's generational wealth and uh, one party doesn't have to work. But if we continue this game, which the Fed has, has tried since 1913 and achieved, of where you have continued inflation, what that does is it makes it so people can't save money. 
They have to put their money in the stock market. They have to put their money in the housing market. They have to do something speculative to get ahead. And a lot of times, since wages lag, uh, real wages lag, or wages lag the price of inflation, therefore real wages, you see them stagnant, you know, since the 1970s or so. That means that the, the woman or the man, there, there needs to be two incomes coming into the family. And that goes back to the kids being raised, uh, you know, strictly by women. And it's, uh, again, you know, the, using the analogy that, uh, that Rich used, you throw all this stuff into a blender. And economically, I think it means more inflation in the future. It means more money printing and it means fewer goods and services being created. It means the sta- it's not that there's this utter collapse of the entire system, but it means the standard of living uh, continues to go down unless we're able to get on a different path where where both uh, parties, you know, men and women are understanding the issue. And we want to get back to what we've historically done for millions or hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of years where we're put on this planet to uh, to procreate. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> Fortunately, that's the way we're hardwired. I was going to um, I'll, I'll just throw my two cents in here real quickly is that um, I think that what we're seeing right now is with respect to marriage in a conventional sense is we're seeing a fundamental reimagining of the relationship between men and women as a result of bringing women into, like, say, the workforce or making them putting them into a position of social power that we have after the uh, sexual revolution. So right now we're looking at things like, you know, poly relationships or we're looking at, you know, quote unquote, equal partnerships or an an egalitarian kind of ideal in in relationships, which simply doesn't work because and we can see that it doesn't work because now here we are in the 21st century and we have access to the data that shows us that when a woman gets a, a you know, an increase in pay or she gets a, you know, promotion at work that precipitates divorce. Why? Well, because innately speaking, that woman wants a guy who is more valuable, who is taller, stronger, more protective, all you know, the three P's, provisioning, pro- protection, and parental investment. And mm-hmm. if that guy cannot provide, if that guy cannot make as much money, and that's how we, that's the only metric that women really have right now. If that guy's not making that much money, he's economically unattractive. She doesn't want to marry that guy and she doesn't want to pair with that guy because on an evolutionary level, that makes her feel insecure. Right. He is now he's dead weight. He's somebody that she, he's another child that she has to be responsible for in the family to some degree, whether he's, you know, whether he's making a lot of money or he's not, uh, he's making less than she is. And so therefore, um, she is, uh, She's responsible for another, you know, for his security. Whereas, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, it should be the other way around, where the guy is. It. So, so convincing women to like when we're, when Rich was saying, you know, well, we have to, or Rich and Aaron and, and everybody else is saying, you know, well, we've got to find some way to sort of convince women that 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 shouldn't be the case. It's like saying, it's like saying men should be attracted to fat chicks, right? right, right saying right. that like it's it's like saying something that's fundamentally it goes against our innate nature. That's never going to happen with women. But what we've done is we've given women the option to say, okay, you can you can be in control of your own security. You can have all the benefits of sort of this new order way of thinking, but you have all you're still based in your old order innate biological needs for these guys to be yeah. who they are and what they ought to be. So what you what you see, I think one of the things that's sort of like a rude awakening, I think for most guys right now is when they saw those at the um, the data sets for um, women finding men economically unattractive, they also asked, well, what would make a man economically attractive? And they found that the man had to make at least as much they as they did, plus fifty eight percent more. That made a guy uh, economically attractive. That's that put him up into at least the quote unquote you know high value man. Uh, Top fourteen percent. When I did the numbers, fourteen percent of men. Yes, yes. And so, like you said, the eye of the needle kind of thing. And I think the the root awakening is this: is that most men approach love from an idealistic perspective. We think that love should matter just for the sake of love, right? Because we tend to be idealists. We tend to look out at the world instead of in at ourselves, which is really where women start to look, right? They're they're more interested in people, and men tend to be more interested in things, right? So as a result of that, when we talk about like how women don't want to get with a guy who's economically unattractive, what that does is it exposes the game. Women love opportunistically and women lo- or men love idealistically. How do we know that? Well, we can see that women don't want to marry guys who don't make more enough money, don't make the kind of money that they do. 
you give women enough money and you give them enough financial like we're, I'm, I'm looking at the stats right here this is from uber facts is worldwide females earn 18 trillion dollars but they spend 28 trillion dollars that to me sounds a lot like opportunism right there um the other stat was this is uh you know american women hold two-thirds of student debt so when you look at things like this it's like yeah women want to find either a guy that's going to help them pay that debt or they're going to vote for the guy who's going to say yeah we're going to absolve all of your student debt <laughs> and put you in the presidency because you, that's that was part of your your presidential platform was to get us out of debt so to me that sounds a lot like opportunism right there so when when we're looking at those things it's sort of is a rude awakening for guys who want to believe that their their sort of you know their their love ideal is based on I love you just as much as you love me. It's like well, women and men are approaching that in marriage, approaching love, approaching solving their reproductive problems and everything else from different perspectives. And we can see that in black and white now that we have access to the internet, we have access to all of this this stuff. And so, and then finally is this, is that I think that in the future, we're starting to see these, you know, polyamory, we're starting to see, you know, po po really polygamy is what it is. And this is an old school uh, Royce quote, which is, you know, women would rather share a high value alpha than be saddled with a faithful beta loser. And so what's happening right now is, is the high, the really super high value guys are going to be the ones who are going to be the cads who are going to end up outbreeding the dads. Because those dads are not as they're they might be raising the children of the guys that women want to get with and want to have sex with and want to reproduce with, but those other guys, as long as they are beta males who are economically unattractive and in other ways uh, unattractive, as as Rich was saying before, is like they're not on their game. They're not on their they're not trying to become the best you know man that they can they can possibly be if they don't even just check out of the game you know entirely. What happens then is we have a society that has to adjust for that. So right now, when when we talk about we when we make single dads or stepdads superheroes, we're basically saying you know give up your your any any claim you have to your own paternity, and that's okay. And women will say you know a, a real man is a guy who steps up and takes over even if the kid's not his. When we start popularizing narratives like that, it's as a result of trying to change over to a new form of relationship, and that's what I think is going to end up replacing modern conventional marriage right now. Yeah, so, that, that means a lower population. And, yeah. uh, yeah, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to invent these new categories of like yes. marriages and relation. Like society lies to women as much as it does to men, right? I mean, like right. one of the more common ones is you start to see a lot of these shows and like video clips of these uh, career driven women with the stay at home father. And right. then they portray, you know, the family unit as a oh, modern family marriage. It's a right? modern family. It's very mm -hmm. successful. Everybody's happy, except for when you look at the guy, he's a brow beaten plow horse. You know that they're not banging. Maybe they have like transactional sex once every three months or something like that. And you can see it in her face. She's not happily married to this guy. She does not look up to him. There's no way that she ever looks up to a guy like that. The clock is ticking down to the end of that relationship at some point. Yeah. But again, women will consume these narratives, hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, I can go, you know, climb the corporate ladder, go feminism. Women are equal to men, blah, blah, blah. And they go and fabricate these new families which don't last. You know, they don't serve the children properly. They sure as hell don't serve the man and woman properly. Yeah. I, I responded to a guy, I forget what, what conversation this was from, but somebody had said something about how, or maybe I was doing a breakdown video, and somebody had said something about how men should have the opportunity to be stay-at-home dads if they want to. Mm -hmm. right? And that that should be some sort of ennobling. I blame uh, Mr. Mom. Wasn't that a movie in the 80s yeah. with Michael Keaton? Yeah, as if that should be some sort That's of. That's when like, it started. Yeah, and like that, there's like this large demographic of guys who are just pining over the fact that they can't be like stay-at-home moms, like a, like you know, like a mom, right? Like the Mister Mom narrative. And I'm just like, there are literally no guys that want to do that. There's, I mean, the, and if there are, it is such a minuscule percentage of guys that really want to do something like that and it's not because they're assholes and it's not because they're not you know evolved males or anything like that it's because that goes against their innate biological imperatives is what it is you know yeah. most and you know what's interesting to me is like even even in in light of human males investment in their own offspring it's very rare in the animal kingdom for men or for excuse me for for male animal male mammals at least 
to be invested in the in the upbringing of their own offspring. It's usually left to the to the to females to do something like that, and men are actually more invested, even as much as they can be right now. But when we see how marriage is a an all downside contract for guys, that's by design. That's but that's that we're we're there right now because we're trying to figure out how we're going to allow women to maintain this old order ideal where they want to have the best of the best. They, they still have to have, they're still, you know, their mating strategy is still hypergamy. They're still interested in quality, but yet the, the new order benefits, which is you can go and get your, go get your degree and go get, become a doctor and go get your, you know, you're going to be lonely. Those are going to be the, the results of that are going to be in the future in 2030, the likelihood of you being a prime working age woman who is single, at no children and unmarried are high are, m are much more likely as a result of that. So we're we're trying to tell women that they don't have these they, these consequences aren't going to be affecting them when in fact they are. And then when they get to that point, then that's a bridge that they'll cross when they get to that point. But in the meantime, we have to find some way to convince them, as Rich was saying here before, whether it's through popular media or through you know, pop culture, through through te television shows or stories or whatever the popular narrative is, is that this is the new way that we're doing things. And it, we're still that new way is conflicting with the old order, innate biological evolutionary imperatives of human beings. That's just how the machine works. That's just how we evolved. So there's that side. Okay, so my next my next question is this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna lead up to uh, to this really quickly here. And and George, you're probably gonna love this one. Uh, I'm I'm picking up these stats from a a, a website called uh, Zero Hedge. I'm you sure. may be familiar with them or not. Sure. Um, this was from uh, this is a this was from December of 2020. Why is there an increasing share of women that are leaving the labor force? Now that's not the stat that I thought was interesting. These they did a, a graphic analysis of this. I'm just going to read it to you because it's they'll be just go quicker that way. From 1973 to 1975, higher female LFP, which is labor force participation, mm -hmm. uh, and lower male labor for LFP. Okay. So, and I, I can read you the numbers here, but it's anyways, it's, uh, you know, males declined by 0.7%. Uh, for women, it rose by 1.5%. And that's between 1973 and 1975, 1980 to 82, higher, higher female LFP, lower, lower male L, uh, LFP. In fact, for women, it was up 3.2%. Whereas for men, it fell 0.6%. 1990 to 1991, higher, excuse me, flat LFP for females, higher for males during that time. And then during 2001, right after 9-11, lower females versus a higher male LFP. Um, and then from 2008 to 2009, higher female LFP to lower male LFP. And um, again, for for women, it rose by point four percent. Um, and then I, there's I can, I'll give I'll put the the link to this article in here. But then, of course, right after um, 2020, right when during the pandemic, now we see a lower uh, or excuse me, an increasing share of women are leaving the labor force right there. So that's that's number one. Uh, number two is this, and this is also from Zero Hedge. The U.S. economy is now run by women. Okay. So, so much for the patriarchy. At the top of the helm in President Biden's economic cabinet are numerous women. For example, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, uh, Trade Czar Catherine Tai, all collectively help run the economy. Many of President Biden's economic advisors are also women, Reuters noted this week. Okay. Uh, the effects of having women in charge of the economy are already being noted. Biden's $2.3 trillion spending plan includes $400 billion of support for jobs that take care of kids and seniors. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has pointed out that uh, pointed to a focus on human infrastructure. So that, uh, and then of course, and this is also part of this, I won't read the whole thing, but it says women also run finance ministries in 16 and 14 of the world's central, uh, 16 countries and 14 of the world's central banks right now. So what we're looking at, I think, in, in terms of economics is concerned, we're looking at a female control of not just the U.S. economy, but world economies as well. So my question is this, how has feminism or gynocentrism affected economics? And, and can you speak to, to what you're seeing as far as you know, being the economics guys? What, what, what effect do you think that that is having? Well, I think it, that's uh, 
I think you opened up a can of worms there that, that you might not have intended to open up. <laughs> because, <laughs> so uh, I believe that if you look at the, the way dollars are created, I shouldn't say I believe this is this is accurate. Um, in the past, for the, usually it's the commercial banking system. When they create a loan, they created an additional dollar that did not exist before. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way the commercial banking system is run, has been run for many, many, many decades. So now we're in an environment where it's a, it, it's this hybrid system where you have the commercial banking system actually creating fewer dollars. They're doing fewer loans since those PPP loans we saw in, what was it, March or, or April of 2020. So the amount of dollars in the system based on that statistic alone should be going down. Therefore, we should be seeing significant deflation. But what's happening is the government is coming in U.S. government and spending all of these, this uh, deficit spending for infrastructure and for this and for that. And it's being monetized by the Fed. So you see a counterbalance where those dollars are actually increasing and making up for the lack of dollars that are being created by the commercial banking system. OK, you say, George, so what? What does that have to do with what we're talking about? Um, it means that the Fed is, is not central to the dollar. Uh, and, and, and in order for the Fed to be central to the dollar, uh, they need to control the lending in the real economy. They need to control the amount of dollars that are being produced. Therefore, they can have a better control over inflation, which is what the government needs to pay all these bills. Right. And, and the only way that they get there is through a central bank digital currency. OK, so why is this a big deal? Because if the Fed is in charge of lending into the real economy, which, by the way, was Alexander Hamilton's original idea with the very first central bank we had in the United States, is that it would be a, an entity that could lend into the real economy. But if the Fed is doing this, there's a big difference between the Fed lending and a commercial bank lending and the fact that a commercial bank is constrained by a P&L. So they have to lend based on people who are going to most likely pay them back or they're going to go bust. You see, that's why we have a credit score as an example. Mm -hmm. um, a central bank doesn't have to do that. They don't have that constraint because they can print dollars. They can print bank reserves. So if they issue a loan for a mortgage to XYZ person, they don't necessarily have to do it on their credit score because it's not that big of a deal if they don't get paid back because they're not going to go bust. So why that's important is because if you have women that are running the show, let's say, uh, then we have a, a dollar that's totally in the control of the central planners. And if those central planners are women or men or any political party, they can start issuing credit favorably to certain groups and making other groups uh, pay a higher interest rate, as an example. You could have monetary policy down to the individual level. So let's just say that we're part of this um, uh, gynocentric social order, I think is how you'd say it, Rolo, correct? Okay, well, if that's true, and if we've got more and more women that are calling the shots, and if the central planners now have control completely over the dollar, therefore lending, you could see an environment where a lot of the lending and favoritism is going to that group that has political favor. Uh, whether that's women <laughs> or, or or some sort of XYZ disadvantaged group. But I can tell you the group that's probably not going to be getting uh, the favorable interest rates based on their social score will be uh, will be straight men who are out there. Us, uh, basically. Uh, yeah, the guys on this phone call right now. <laughs> yeah. But so I, I just wanted to throw that in there because it's not just about women controlling spending. If we can, if we see this continue, it's going to potentially be about women controlling the dollar itself and controlling every aspect of lending throughout our entire economy, whether that's for consumption, whether that's for productivity, you name it. And I'm not saying that's bad or good. I'll let the viewers decide for themselves. But that's uh, that's really the bottom line and what we're looking at if it goes that direction. Hmm. Aaron, did you have something to add to that? Kind of. Uh, no, George took an interesting route through the control of lending through central banks. And I, the only thing I was, I was going to point out is because you're talking about all these women that are in various positions of power in finance ministries. That's hmm. not the economy. That's the government. Uh, which is largely, if we're going to look at it through that lens, is an affirmative action program. And you said 14 out of 16 Western nations. What? Oh, the same 14 out of 16 nations that have horrific finances like we do. 
So the only thing that I guess would uh, depend to what uh, George said is that with women in positions of levers of power in government or the public sector, you're going to have uh, more government spending, whether that's through taxation or money printer go burr, uh, which would create a, an increased welfare state, which yeah, yeah, yeah. either through inflation or higher taxation or more likely a combination of both. Uh, the real economy, both men and women are going to have to work harder uh, to make real GDP <clears throat> and not to mention make honest on the, the lending and the inflation. But what I was looking at, because your, your question Rola, was, what is the effect of feminism on the economy or what has it been? Yeah. Kind of yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm focusing more on the actual economy itself. Um, classical, simple economic theory, more women entering the labor force, more labor productivity, higher GDP. And that did, that more or less did hold. But uh, if you look at the labor productivity fee, and, and, and you have to do this over time, uh, it wasn't as much of an increase on a per person basis. And you could see this uh, in what I would call a charity or welfare or make work government jobs programs. Yeah, if, right. women went, if women went in and were engineers, accountants, um, <clears throat> electricians, tradesmen, linemen, uh, people who actually produce real GDP, we'd have that. But I've said this before, a tragically high percentage of women are going into the labor force to take care of other women who are going into the labor force to take care of other women's children to take care of, because they're too busy working to, because they got to work their job to take care of other women's children. Where it's like, well, if you just stayed at home, you wouldn't be paying taxes on it. We've essentially taxed motherhood. We've made it a, a taxable transaction. Mm -hmm. But you throw in all these other jobs that are either completely bogus and there's not a penny of real production, diversity and inclusion, uh, pr professionals, worthless, teachers, worthless, professors, worthless, sociologists, worthless, social workers, worthless. They have not resolved one problem, produced one thing of GDP. <clears throat> and so when you look at the efficacy or the efficiency of women entering the labor force, it was not the same punch had it been doubling of the male labor force. So there was an increase in labor productivity, uh, but not as much as it would have been had we all been working real jobs. And so now what has happened is kind of this quasi bizarro world where there are certainly women who are CPAs, doctors, surgeons, and there are obviously, but a higher percentage of them are in these essentially welfare jobs programs. The ego employment is essentially what it is. <laughs> and that and there's sociological consequences. Kids don't have their parents around. Uh, there's stress on marriages, uh, divorce. We could go through all that other stuff. <clears throat> but financially, it would also cause uh, some supply-based uh, uh, inflation uh, yeah, because right. we're, we're, we're forking over $100, and normally you forked it over to a predominantly male labor force. You get a, 100 widgets. Now we're forking over $200. We should get 200 widgets, but we're only getting about 180 because 20 of the additional widgets are make work, broken window fallacy, government affirmative action, charity, you know. Nonprofit, there's a huge big goose egg for the US economy. I mean, so um that's that's been the effect. There have been some genuine economic gains, uh, but uh there's been an increase in the welfare state, uh, not as direct correlation efficient economic gains as there should have been. And so now as a society, we all kind of pay a price in, in, in eating those uh inflationary costs. Yeah, that's the bottom line. Is that everything we're talking about is inflationary if you're looking at it from an economic standpoint, because even Janet Yellen you know, is very what they call dovish, which means that she's uh, an economist that favors more money printing, uh, looser money, you know, lower interest rates. And then, you know, one of the advisors is Stephanie Kelton, who is kind of the, the author of, of, of MMT. Uh, so you combine those things together and it goes right back to what Aaron was saying with, uh, you know, propensity for a lot of money printing to specialty products. One of the basis of MMT is a jobs guarantee program. So uh, but those jobs, of course, are allocated by the government, not the private sector. And we know how efficient the government allocates resources. <laughs> to, to correct you, George, she was not the first author of MMT. That was Karl Marx. He's <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm not saying the first author. Yeah, yeah. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I think people should, if they're in the United States and if they're in one of these economies that are headed this direction, I mean, A, be aware of it. And then um, B, you know, set up a financial plan that will most likely benefit from the profligate spending 
of uh, of the government if if we go down this path, which I think the probabilities are high. You know, in the short run, you know, the next year or two, who knows what happens to the dollar? Uh, the whole system wants to deflate, but I just think that based on what we were just saying, you see more inflation. So you, you'd want to hold some gold for sure. Uh, you'd want to hold something like Bitcoin that doesn't have any counterparty risk or limited counterparty risk. And then, you know, you want to pr- hold hard assets and then you want to secure those hard assets with, and I know, I don't think you have this in Canada, Rich, correct me if I'm wrong, but ideally you'd want to hold that positive cash flowing asset with 30 year fixed rate mortgage because you're going to be paying that mortgage back with highly devalued dollars, which is a, a transfer of wealth from the, the bank to you. And I can explain that further, but that's kind of broad stroke, uh, you know, my, my advice to people from an investment standpoint. I was going to drag Rich into this yeah. really quickly too, because Rich, you just did like what a couple of weeks ago. You did a show about how you were just basically fed up with Canada and the fifty-three percent or sixty-two. I don't even know what it was. The percentage of you know uh, taxes you're paying, as well as the luxury tax for owning, I guess, a McLaren. Both of which, by the way, Rich and George Gammon own McLaren, so they're McLaren <laughs> guys. I just thought I was actually going to wear my McLaren beanie today, just because <laughs> I could be in the cool kids club. But um, Rich is. Uh, Rich's is a lot better than mine, but yeah. But Rich is so. Rich was talking about this on on a show that he was just saying, "Look, I'm I've got a one year plan to get out of this uh, of this country and to go buy a boat somewhere." Um, and then, but p- as part of that discussion, Rich, and this is to bring you into this, is is part of that discussion. You were saying like uh, the money that you are spending, like the taxes that you are spending, is going to programs that you don't agree with that you don't right. you, you don't want I, I don't want critical race theory i don't maybe that's not what they teach in canada but like as far as like where the money is being go is, is headed to mm-hmm. um, so as in that respect um how has like say feminism gynocentrism affected where that money is going in canada i don't know enough about can canadian economics mm-hmm. and government to to speak yeah well. the tax rates are much like if you think the tax rates in a place like california are high you know, I invite you to come live somewhere where it's cold seven months of the year <laughs> and you're taxed higher <laughs> and they cram just as much, if not more liberalism and socialist, you know, agenda down your throat everywhere you go. Um, so yeah, like has, has it affected the economy? Absolutely. Because guys that do the work, you know, guys that put a dent in the universe that go and create commerce, which by the way, I know, I mean, I can count them on two hands now, but I know probably about 15 very successful entrepreneurs, and I can count on two hands how many of them have have, have packed their bags and moved their business out of Canada in the last two years. Mm-hmm. And the tipping point for most of them was like the pandemic lockdown bullcrap. It was like, okay, I was I was dealing with the cold winters. I was dealing with the high tax rates not being able to maneuver and following these silly rules for something that kills almost nobody is just, I'm done. I'm out. That was it. That was the last straw. So to the point of the wealth transfer, yeah, they treat highly successful people, which for the most part is men, you you know, like running these businesses, paying the huge tax rates, like tax cattle and they steal from them and they put it into programs and agendas, which I don't agree with much, which most of these guys also don't agree with. Um, but it, it, you know, everybody's got to vote. Every, Mm -hmm. every citizen of Canada can cast a vote, but most people in Canada vote for policies that endorse and facilitate mediocrity. Like there's no incentive for anybody to start up a business in Canada. And I tell guys all the time, you know, they call it in my live show and they're like, Hey, I want to move to Canada and start a business. I'm like, don't come here. There's better places in the world that you can set up a business where, the environment is more friendly to you and is more conducive to success. Yeah. Um, so there's that point. I also wanted to touch on something else because you were opening with that stat on women leaving the workforce. Yeah, yeah, right? the labor force participation. So interesting story because I was married to a lawyer and um, you know, there's a, a lot of these group events that they uh, host with the law firms. And this is common with all female professionals I noticed after a while is, they get into the workforce, they get their piece of paper on the wall, framed in mahogany with little letters after their name saying how important they are and what they've done in life. They'll climb the corporate ladder, they'll make some money, they'll make six figures, maybe $150,000 a year. And then they'll start to realize, well, hold on a second, I'm 34-ish, my eggs are starting to dry up, I need to figure out the baby sort of thing. 
Uh, I can't work 22 hours a day in a law firm because it's ridiculous, like it, like it's killing them. Like these women age a lot faster than regular women that aren't working 22 hours a day. And what they do is they either put themselves on a part-time basis, so they're working way fewer hours once they find a guy that has adequate provisioning, or um, they'll move from um, a high stress environment like a law firm working 20 hours a, a day as a junior lawyer into in-house counsel at let's say a corporation or a bank. And a lot of these institutions have like an, their in, entire in-house legal team, which can consist of 100, 120 lawyers, you know, in some cases, de depending on the size of the corporation, and almost all of them are all women, right? So mm -hmm. some of them leave the labor force, some of them cut back the work hours to part-time, some of them leave, you know, the high stress environments and they go to the more, um, easier sort of pastures to go and, you know, work out the rest of their years at so they can try to raise a family, find a guy and, you know, lock it down. So that's another part of the equation too. Yeah. 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 They favor a, a work-life balance, which there is no work-life balance. You can't. Yeah. 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 When you're an entrepreneur and if you're building a business, um, it's all about focus. You know, I've seen, I've seen focus. female entrepreneurs from EO in the chapter in Toronto, get pregnant, have a baby, and then go back to work two years later, or sorry, not two two weeks later, and then they just dump off the kid with some you know Filipino nan nanny to raise a child, right? If you go and you look at, and I, I tweeted this out not too long ago, if you go and you look at the top ten richest women in the world, every single woman on that right. list made her money by either divorce or by inheriting it from a dead husband or a dead father. And, and I mean, the richest women, and Mackenzie Bezos, I think is like number five on that list, actually. Yeah. And then she gave away half the money to feel good yeah, charities right, like right away. That'll solve the problem. That'll, yeah. everything's yeah. going to be okay. Now. That'll cure the world, right? Yeah, exactly. I, 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 we're, we're coming up on time and I want, I still, I, I want to get to the, uh, the, the part where, uh, we're going to talk about like, how can men benefit from this? Although I, I do want to make can go them, later. I got, give time. me like five minutes know. to go through all the super chats too. Cause they've piled Yeah. Up I was going to say, why, why don't we do that now? Let's go you through that right now just see yeah, what we got here really quick because there were some uh, there were some uh, connected at george that i know are going to take a little while yeah, there's a shout out to george uh <laughs> tell him moody the millennial says hi hashtag and the fed yeah he's he's always on my line. he's a good uh, guy mexi mike i'm glad george is exposed to cooper uh rollo aaron aaron this is the guy i was telling you about who explained the crack up boom that happened in venezuela i was asking your thoughts on george gammon uh, I'm giddy having George and Aaron out nerd macroeconomics. George is awesome. <laughs> explaining complex financial theories. Uh, Aaron is smart, insightful, painfully honest about everything. You all rock. We do. We do. Thanks, Mike. Yes. Yes. Got all those. Mm -hmm. Let's get these ones. As per one of Peter Schiff's tweets, IMF agreed with the Fed that U.S. inflation is transitory. Can higher inflation be sustained? Your thoughts? I guess that's a question for George. What do you think, George? Uh, yeah, and I think we were pretty much addressing a lot of that in what we were saying. It doesn't mean that we can't have a deflationary deleveraging as well, but I think the probability is higher that we see sustained inflation uh, because of that transitioning from this hybrid system into a system where the central bank or the central planners themselves, the, the ladies or guys in government, are controlling the issuance of dollars. Mm. Um, that's... Cal L. Harry, uh, fantastic to see you all working together to talk about the numbers involved, assuming a possible population collapse continuing. Where do you see yeah. real estate trending? I imagine more deflationary forces. Uh, this yeah. is your wheelhouse again, George. Yeah. So the, the question there that you have to ask that, that precedes that, Harry, is whether you're referring to prices in nominal terms or real terms. Because we can have a, a crash in the real estate market while at the same time, prices are, are always going up. And I would use Venezuela. The gentleman prior talked about a crack up boom, which is a theory from Ludwig von Mises. Uh, and is very similar to what you saw in Venezuela, where the price of your house in Venezuela denominated in boulevards never went down. But it sure as hell crashed right because your your house is buying less stuff because it's denominated in a currency that's losing value faster so maybe a better example would be if you've got a hundred thousand dollar house and it's increasing in value or the price is increasing by five percent per year but inflation is ten percent per year then the value the purchasing power of your house is actually decreasing by five percent compounded 
So you can have an environment where the the real purchasing power, the real prices go down. And I, if if you're in the United States, if you look at a chart going back to 1900, we hit the bottom or our historic trend line adjusted for inflation back in 2012. So that's what that's telling us is that's where prices should be based on on proper free market uh, interest rates and income levels. Therefore, we need to come down back down to that level. But again, the question is, do we come down there in nominal terms or do we come down there in terms just adjusted for inflation? And that's why it's so hard for people to make a decision on whether or not to buy a house right now. You know, I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, we're in this big bubble, so I'm just going to wait until the bubble crashes. It might crash up. It might not crash down. Mm. And that's something that people really don't, uh, it's tough for them to get their mind around. Also too, I'd, I'd, I'd point out that even in the last, you know, big collapse we had during the GFC, it took real estate prices six years to bottom. A real estate is not like the stock market where it can go down by 20% in, in one day, you know, like black Monday or something like that. Uh, the real estate market, it takes a long time for it to turn around. So, um, I, I would, it's, it's a very touchy subject right now because you're buying, um, a property that is usually, uh, has been seen as the asset. And I would argue the property now is the, is the liability and, and the, the debt, the 30 year fixed rate mortgage is actually the asset because I think you'll probably decrease your purchasing power with the property, but you'll increase your purchasing power to a greater degree by holding the 30 year fixed rate debt uh, mortgage. So um, it, it, it's it's a upside down world, but I, I just like to point those things out because usually when people try to think through real estate, they just think about it in nominal terms and they think about it uh, having the ability to cr- collapse, quote unquote, overnight like a stock market. And it doesn't work that way. All right. Uh, we got a little hat tip here for Cappy's book, The Book of Numbers. Um, Michael J., thanks for the content and insights, fellas. Thanks for the super. Uh, we're almost caught up here. Loving opportunistically is being a mercenary, sickening. I want to say this to you guys. Um, I always see guys that like, you know, go the doom and gloom corner. It's like mm. water is wet. The sun is hot. Women are women. Just accept them for what they are and respond accordingly. Mm-hmm. Wasn't that uh, a quote from the last Boy Scout? <laughs> I think it was. Don't know. Uh, a team, uh, <laughs> those not willing to improve themselves are the ones creating the market for those willing to do the work, like short sellers. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's why I keep telling you guys, do the damn work. Uh, competent man to George. Did you see within the past few years where some uh, predict the reverse repo is about to go to $2 trillion? few minutes ago, uh, Zed Zero Hedge, hedge. Zero hedge. Uh, consumer credit surge. You want to touch on that? Yeah, he's talking about a gentleman by the name of Zoltan Pozar, who's kind of a, a guru on Wall Street. I think he works at Credit Suisse. And he predicted the last repo blow up that we had in 2019. And he's saying that the reverse repos could go up by uh, $2 trillion. Without getting too wonky, guys, uh, the, the reason that could um, indicate a, a, another crack in the system is because uh, the the banks who we we're talking about creating the dollars typically, they create those loans backed with bank reserves. So if you have uh, two trillion in reverse repo, there's only about four trillion in bank reserves in the system, which is huge compared to prior to GFC. But you're taking, let's say, half those bank reserves out of the system. So the uh, the balance sheet capacity or the lending capacity of the commercial banking system decreases in an environment where they're already producing lower dollars. So in a free market, that would mean asset prices would deflate in nominal terms. But to Aaron's point earlier. I think they're going to go the MMT route, the money printing route, which is going to overwhelm, um, you know, what they're doing here. But the release va- valve inevitably has to be the U.S. dollar. George, I got to interrupt here just because he's new to this. George, look, most of our audience is men, and now with that sexy, sweet economic talk, we're going to be flooded with women. They're going to want your phone number and wonder if you're single. I mean, how do you keep the women off you, George? That would be a seminar unto itself. Well, you know what's funny is I, uh, I, I was someone texted me a picture of uh, Rebel Capitalist Live where. Um, you know, there was quite a few people there that wanted to get their picture taken with me. And I had a group of uh, three or four gals 
that wanted to get their picture taken with me and someone sent that to me so i tweeted it out and i said i say chicks dig macro <laughs> <laughs> well those four did anyway <laughs> uh this is straight up social scores that you george and rao paul explain with the entire behavioral economics yeah. uh, with yes for some no for others that's correct yeah so and, 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 to and other, going to this points. if we move into this world uh that that um that rollo is talking about where uh you know women are more in charge uh, you could see that lending being directed in areas uh, that we really can't conceive right now. And again, I, I don't want to say it's uh, it's bad or good, but it's going to have economic uh, unintended consequences. I can assure you of that. Hmm. Rich Cooper's used TRT needle. I haven't seen this guy in my live shows in a while, but he's got he's got a comment there with a very old picture of me he found somewhere on the internet. We need more RP influence and law judges, lawyers. Yes. Sure, guys. You know, um, get out there and get in those professions if you think that you can contribute to this to the solution. I've always said that that it, the, the red pill has to be a bottom up. Yeah, it yeah. Be, it I'm in. Um, I'm in Aaron's camp. I'm just going to sit on his uh, porch. You know, watch the sunset over the mountains and drink a beer and watch it burn with him. <laughs> um, Sean says uh, George Soros funds open society foundations, which promotes far left advocacy, which invests yeah. thirty two billion dollars to solve any problem you get to root. Yeah, all this is based on uh, Marxism. It, 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 all, most uh, every narrative that we're seeing in society today in the Western world has its roots in Marxism, and um, you know that that usually uh, doesn't end well. But as Hayek said, you know, if, even though you're on the road to serfdom, uh, there is a possibility to get off. It, it's not a foregone conclusion that you move into totalitarianism which is where the road to serfdom leads. So we can do it, you know, and I think there's the, I think the optimistic, uh, you know, ray of sunshine here is that even if we're moving into this environment where, uh, you know, women are climbing the socioeconomic ladder, therefore uh, the Pareto distribution goes from a 2080 to a, a 5%, 95%. If you're part of that 5%, then uh, at least from a standpoint of uh, of dating, you're going to have a lot of options, you know. Mm. So the, it's I think it's an empowering message to men and to women to some degree, uh, but to men knowing that it's within your control. Go out there, like Rich says, do the work uh, mm. because moving forward, it's going to be a, quite a bit easier too to be that that five percent top shelf uh, uh, group of guys because we're trying to force men to, to become women and women to become men. So in that environment, you get um, not very good men and not very good women. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing the work and uh, pursuing excellence, you know, you're going to be part of that top five and you're going to have access to a lot more choice than you maybe would have uh, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and the women in your life are going to, you know, as long as you're not an asshole, if you're a good dude, uh, they're gonna they're gonna have that respect for you, and if you choose to get into a long term relationship, the probability of it being healthy and long lasting is going to be much higher. Guys, no more super chats, please. We want to finish up the question that Roll's got lined up, but I'm just going to finish these real real quick. Uh, Mexi Mike says, "Rich is echoing what Andrew Andrew Henderson essentially proposed to Patrick B. Pat, David. I think that's Pat David. Yeah, yeah, Pat David. Uh, as Henderson challenged Pat and explained how us has become." Entitled to Productive People's Thesis. Uh, I think that means U.S. is an idea, not a place. Uh, Sean Ga, as a Canadian viewer, one request from Rich. Could you pr please bring Mark Moss to your podcast? Uh, I'm working on trying to get Tim S. Grover on right now because I just finished his two books. Um, so I really only bring on guys that I'm genuinely interested in having conversations on right now. Uh, hey, George, do you think it would be a good idea to invest in a ETF that would short the NASDAQ. No, because we can have a crack up boom. It goes back to the housing question. The NASDAQ can continue to go up in nominal prices, but lose value in purchasing powers when you adjust for inflation. So I, I don't think short, especially when we're going into an environment of all this money printing. Yeah. No, the last thing I would do is short the NASDAQ. Uh, some gratitude from somebody that's enjoying your feedback. The competent man, additional Wells Fargo just announced they're closing all personal credit lines. Yeah, of yeah. course they want, you know, <laughs> you can make a lot more money off credit cards. It's, it's, it generates about a third of the bank's profits really. Uh, yeah. And those are fewer dollars being created too, by the way. Yeah. 
Randy, uh, George, how can I attract joint venture partnerships for property development African market when I don't have much capital to start with? Well, you've got to have, so you've got more time than you have resources. So you have to make yourself valuable somehow. So why would someone want to give you their money? Uh, I would go out and work in an environment where you can get the experience you need to branch off on your own and start your own fund. And then I'd follow Kenny McElroy's uh, YouTube channel because that's exactly what Ken does, does right now. And he worked his way up from the bottom. So I, I would follow everything that Ken has done over his life and what he's doing now. And, uh, you know, he's managing over a billion dollars with the real estate and doing extremely well. So I'd use him as kind of a mentor. Uh, billionaire Ross Perot, uh, stacking fat bucks to donate two dollars to remind you all that financial trouble was coming. Uh, Roy Washington, in order, uh, what would you do? Become debt free, buy a cattle a truck to work for myself, buy a house. I have two kids, and I'm said, dude, it depends where where you live, what your income is, how much yeah. debt you have, right. what kind of money is this truck gonna you know pay off for you. Um, it's very difficult to answer. Yeah, if he's like in that. the United States and he looked like a, a young guy, uh, what I always encourage young guys and gals for that matter to think about doing is something called house hacking, where you go out and buy a triplex and you secure it with 30 year fixed rate uh, mortgage, like we were saying at a very low interest rate, you know, say three or 4%. And then basically if you can get it in the right area, the right neighborhood and buy right, uh, you can get your tenants to pay off your mortgage and have a little bit of positive cash flow left over at the end. And, um, you know, people's number one expense is housing. So if you can eliminate that expense and take that thousand or two thousand dollars that you would have spent on a mortgage or rent and allocate it to your investment portfolio, uh, you're going to have a huge edge. So that's what I usually. Uh, but the debt free component of it, I, I totally agree with Dave Ramsey uh, on on one thing and that's that uh you know consumer debt is bad you don't want to take up consumer debt that's 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 the as jim rogers says the quick way to the poor house uh but it doesn't necessarily mean that all debt is bad and when you're going into an environment with a lot of money printing like we said earlier uh having productive fixed rate debt that is allowing you to control an asset that is paying you a positive cash flow to own it monthly uh, could be prudent if you know what you're doing. Mm. All right. So we'll throw the floor back to Rolo. Uh, let's do another question. No more super chats, guys. And also sure. hit the like button. There's like 1,300 of you guys watching, 550 likes. Just help out the algorithms. You know, yep. it doesn't cost you anything. So, uh, this is this was the last question I had on here. And, right. um, and it actually kind of gets to that very last super chat, which Jesse is talking about. Can the average male achieve the top 10% of wealth? Okay. So that was my net. My last question was this was how can men benefit from all of this? Like understanding what we've, what we've just been talking about for the last hour and a half right now. Um, we know what the stats are. We know what the data is. We know what the, we, we, we can at least make some prognostications as to what's coming down the pipes, right? When we talk about the Morgan Stanley, uh, the, the rise of the she economy stuff, uh, when we look at what's going on in the, the rise in the acceptability of like Marxism, really, you know, in society, yeah, that's, right. that's through, through the university systems, which by yeah. the way, are run by women because is more, largely 77, 78% of women, 78% of the teachers you will have in your lifetime from preschool all the way up to postgraduate school will be women. So when we look and we see like the education systems where, where uh, you know, I, I, I think it was interesting, like when we were talking about like all these, uh, you know, these riots that were going on in 2020 and people pulling down statues and all this, uh, you know, Antifa and everything. And they're people are saying, well, you know, they're teaching this communism and this Marxism in this in the university. It's like, yeah, of course they are. You know, it sounds like a good idea when you realize how much we pay the female teachers that are in those systems right now. Marxism probably sounds like a pretty good idea to women who are already predisposed to communitarianism and and egalitarianism and you know emotionalism and everything else any Great loss program though yeah yeah exactly um <laughs> so my my question is is that knowing all of this and you know being on t being in the know i guess um how can we how can men benefit from this can the average guy b become the top 10 percent of wealth i i think so but uh and i, I want to run down like sort of four different little e you know, issues here. One of them is protection. And I think that Rich actually talks about this quite a bit is like protecting your asset. Like what can you do to sort of like, if you're going to get into, you know, do you still want to like guys still want to get laid guys still want to, you know, solve their reproductive problem. They still want to have kids. They still want to, you know, they still want to get the girls, Aaron, <laughs> no, no matter what the numbers say, they still want to get the girls. Um, so how can men 
like protect themselves? Is it just MGTOW? Is marriage going to change completely um, to the point where like guys have to sort of like, you know, have prenuptial agreements all the time? So that's a protection aspect. Then also the rise of the she economy, knowing that women are going to be, uh, let's say, more like lonely, but like more uh, empowered as far as economics are concerned and directing where that money is going in the future. How can you as a guy who is an entrepreneur, who is a guy who's who understands this stuff, how can you benefit from that? How can you make a how can you turn a buck as a result? to that uh also maybe this gets back to what aaron was talking about in his book which the point really uh, correct me if i'm wrong aaron but the point of writing the book of numbers was to sort of make guys aware of the realities of the numbers and the money that they are spending when they are doing that in the pursuit of women that's i believe that's the subtitle of your book right right yes and, it's basically and, plus benefit analysis of and then right. lastly the, the last the fourth part here uh, again benefiting is housing real estate and expatriation uh, which is another thing we were talking about. Rich is going to, uh, at least I believe he has a year plan to expatriate from from Canada. George, I know you don't necessarily live in one place at one time for very long, so I don't know if you're uh, technically an expat, but I know that you don't stay a, a year. You're a Rolling Stone, my friend. Um, so is that part of like benefiting from this new environment that you guys are aware of? Yeah, I mean, Rich, I, I retired in 2012. Uh, I'm not sure when Rich, well, Rich is still kind of in the game. And I have a lot of people ask me entrepreneurial questions. And Rich and I are, think, are, are right around the same age. And I remember when I first started my, uh, or first started a business, you know, you needed to have $100,000. You needed, the last one where I actually had to generate some capital to start was in 2007 or something. We, you know, needed 500000 uh, just as a runway to get the business going. And that business produced, um, you know, call it, we grew it up to about 24 million in annual revenues. But what's amazing now with uh, what we have as far as the internet and the opportunities for us to reach worldwide markets is uh, the barrier of entry is very, very low. You don't have to have $500,000 anymore uh, in order to, to build a business that generates $24 million uh, in, in gross revenue. Uh, you, you can do it. You can add value. There's so many more opportunities out there for young males uh, to make money than we had. Uh, I'm assuming all of us are pretty much the same age uh, growing up in the 1970s and the 1980s. I mean, way more opportunities, way more opportunities. And not only that, to make money quickly. Uh, to make a lot of money quickly. I mean, look at the kids that just started the uh, the fit and uh, fresh and fit. Uh, isn't that the podcast? I mean, look at their success. Look at those guys. That's what hustle will get you, and that's something that could not have been possible. I think. I mean, those kids are are such hustlers. They would have done well regardless. Of I what love that you done. call them kids. I'm gonna I'm gonna, say, I'm I'm gonna, gonna link to right to this kid. moment. Hey, hey, Myron, look at this, you kid. <laughs> <laughs> but but seriously, you know, they're 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 they would do well whatever they did in life. It, it wouldn't yeah. be a matter of if they're going to be successful. It would just be a matter of when they're, they're exploiting successful. the game. They understand yeah. the game well enough that they can play it well. Yeah, but with the internet and with YouTube and with the the, uh, uh, the ability to create content and to get the word out, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're able to to scale much much faster, much opportunity, and the risk reward is far better today. Uh, than it was, in my opinion, by just going out and borrowing 500 grand to start a brick and mortar business. Mm -hmm. Aaron, how can they play the game better? How can we how can we benefit from this? Let me count the ways. I, when you're asking the categories, I, I took some notes. This is going to be a little, uh, little linear here. To capitalize, um, I would go with female index funds, which I do believe would be coming around. Uh, and I know it's, it's the cheap shop, but it's true. I really believe egg freezing technology or the chemicals associated with it, or, uh, you know, media, uh, <clears throat> something that benefits and we all ha ha box wine and cats, I'm sure. But, you know, and a company that provides pet insurance, you know, think what, so I would do that. Uh, I would get a vasectomy unless you're absolutely sure you want to have kids. And even if you have vasectomy, you can also uh, have uh, direct extraction, which you don't want to know the process. Um, never marry would be another uh, defensive move. Uh, and then in terms of hedging against inflation and, and maintaining your wealth, silver, crypto, I call it a plan B. 
uh, which George is familiar with, where you got to make aims to be able to leave the United States or Canada or Western nation and go to where they're not going to confiscate and in Rich's case, 53% of your labor time and effort and energy, or if they just come after you. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, that's a, and that's a task. That's a, it requires travel and all that. I would also hedging against inflation is major in STEM or some other valuable skill because your skills are not only transferable, but they are a natural hedge against inflation. A dentist mm -hmm. just has to jack up their price. Um, mm -hmm. A mechanic just has to jack up their price. A professional asshole like me, I just jack up my price. Uh, make sure that you have skills that are, that are indispensable. Uh, and then finally, more philosophically, insist on being a superior person. Work out, mm -hmm. diet, make sure the right thing, participate in hobbies, make sure your life counts. Mm -hmm. I know we focus on money, but I'm a little bit more of a minimalist philosopher and, and I focus more on time than anything else. I recommend being part of the 1099 superior race, meaning being self-employed. Your life is too short to be answering to a boss and you are – too precious to have your your you know a third at least if you look at profit margins on labor productivity if not half of your worth paid out to a corporation to enrich your employer. Um, I also would advocate minimalism. Although I know Rich and George with their fancy cars probably would disagree, but uh, I would put more generally philosophically more valuable uh, value on time than money. Uh, and then finally, and this is the important one. And this this is where eighty percent of the people. Um, fail. And that is you F up, you screw up. Don't get a girl pregnant. Don't major in something stupid. Don't buy a car you can't afford. Don't smoke uh, and eat unhealthily and play video games. L like, you know, don't commit crime, uh, which I don't think we really have to worry about this listening audience. But if you look at the vast majority of successful people, and by success, I mean, they're not, you know, let's say upper middle income or, or higher. They didn't screw up. They may not have a, a, a doctorate in physics. They may not have a multi-million dollar empire, but they didn't screw up. And so that is something I think everybody can do along with minimalism and all that to kind of take advantage of, of this future. And, and it's been in Rich's book. It's in my, it's put yourself first, make sure you're the best person you can be because at the absolute worst, you will have not wasted your life. Oh, and finally, one other thing. I, I forgot this. Uh, give up your dreams because it wouldn't be me if it wasn't a little bit dark. <laughs> I don't care how much you love the girls. I don't care how much you want wife and kids. Now is not your time. If you get it, great. But do not pine and hope and hinge your happiness on that because it is out of your control. Hmm. But right, what so, about uh, coin collecting? Yeah, what about coin collecting, Aaron? You, you, none of you all are cool <laughs> enough to be coin collecting. <laughs> what about stamps? Are stamps cool? Can I have a stamp collection? Uh, yeah, you could collect stamps. Um, all right, so I'm I'm going to co-sign everything that uh, both Aaron and George said. I, I can't disagree with anything. Um, I just wanted to put this up here real quick. He says, can the average male achieve the top 10% wealth? Uh, I'm going to say no if you're defining yourself as average. Average people don't do extraordinary things, okay? You need to take yourself out of the average category. There's a lot of average people out there. Average people don't put dents in the universe. They might put a little, you know, something in it, but they're not going to do anything dramatic. Um, it has never been easier to make money ever yeah. in yeah. the history of humankind. Mm -hmm. yeah, and one right. of the things that drives me absolutely insane is when guys complain Rich says you need to be a millionaire by the time you're this age. Okay. Why does it why does it piss these guys off? Because they see themselves as average. They see it as an impossible feat. A million dollars is not hard to make. There are trillions of dollars traveling through the internet every second of every day. Even on the weekends. Okay. All you got to do is put something out there and grab something. Solve a problem. Okay product, service, something with recurring revenue. There's any number of things that you can do to grab a little bit of that piece of the pie. What does money do? It solves problems. It allows you to apply a store of value to problems in your life and solve them. If you're an average guy and you're stuck in a mediocre part of the world and you don't have access to financial resources, it's very hard to change your environment. Okay. One of the things that uh, Aaron and George didn't um, touch on was maneuver. Go where you're treated better. If there's a place that taxes you lower, 
that's something that you can consider. If there's a place with a more favorable climate that you'd enjoy, that's something to consider. If there's a place with more attractive, feminine, agreeable women, that's something else that you can consider. Colombia. You don't have to stay where you're at. You can pick up and move. Traveling around the world is very, very easy. Have more than one passport. If you can get two or three passports um, through your parents, through your grandparents on both sides, maternal, paternal, you have an ability to, like, if the Canadian government says to me, F you, I'm going to take away your passport, cool, no problem. I've got two other European passports. I can still travel. I'm not limited to move around. Borders aren't going to stop me from doing what I want to do. Put yourself first. You know, the whole coin phrase Rolo Tomasi uses mental point of origin. Put your damn self first and, 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 and get very, very clear. Get laser focused on the kind of life that you want to live. Because like Aaron said, it moves fast. It like time will fly. You'll never be able to make more time. You can always make more money. You can start up something that sucks, collapses on itself and blows up. And two years later, you could be the bee's knees again. Um, mm -hmm. I can't remember the guy's name, but the uh, two guys that founded Instagram turned around and sold it three years after they started it for a billion dollars to Facebook with 12 employees. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that that's repeatable for all of you guys out there, but don't think for a minute that making money is impossible. It's not. Yeah. I was okay. gonna, uh, let me, I'll just throw my two cents in here is, is uh, I, I co-sign everything everybody else has said here, of course. Um, and, and more to Rich's point, um, I've had it explained to me like this, is that there is a river of money out there. And all you have to do is figure out how to divert some of that river to your little farm. And in today's you know, high tech, you know, internet, what I've called the new order in my, uh, in my fourth book here in today's information society, it has never been easier to figure that out on your own. Um, as these guys are saying, it's never been easier to make money. It's just the, the, the lack of creative intelligence, the lack of trying to like, of, of, I don't know what I'll say innovation, but being clever enough to do so. Um, the other part that I, I, I have to also throw in there is it's uh, resist the lure of easing up on your focus. Um, if you're sedated by something, whether that's pornography, whether that's alcohol, whether that's drugs, whether that's opiates, whether that's uh, video games, whatever it is, you are sedated at some point by something. And it's important to get unsedated from that because you will never reach your potential as long as you are sedated. In fact, this especially for men right now. For women, uh, what is it Rich was saying? Uh, you know, women are told, uh, you know, uh, you do what's right for you, girl. And for men, they're told to do what's, correct me if I'm wrong, I think I got this right. Is, and you, men are told to do the right thing while women are told to do what's right for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, that, that that's, a, that's a good illustration of how we expect certain things from guys and do not put on or do not keep the, uh, the same... The, don't hold the same kind of ideals that you think you ought to have because that's the way you've been conditioned by the blue pill. Okay. So that's, that's that. And then um, last but not least is go read Robert Greene's mastery. Okay. It has never been easier to master something than now. Um, whether that's, you, you know, it used to be that you had to go find a master and become a, an apprentice and, and, you know, spend 10,000 hours to become a, a master at something. And now you can go on YouTube and learn how to hang drywall if that's what you want to do. Um, Lord knows Aaron probably built his entire new house. You don't even want to know what I, yeah, I'm <laughs> practically a master carpenter right now. Yes. Right? Yeah. You learn how to, how do I carpet my house, right? There's, there's probably a video for that. Uh, how do I clean my gun? How do I fish? How do I tie a tie for Christ's sake? Okay. Those kind of things. It's not hard to find that it's never been easier to be a master at something. And we've never had this kind of, you know, ease of access to that kind of stuff, but yet we've never been lazier because you've been sedated by something. So yeah, right. you're sedated by and get away from that sedation because you will not become, you know, above average. Like what does it take to become, to go from ordinary to extraordinary? You will never find out if you are weighted down with the sandbags of being sedated by something so yeah. that's all i got to say and that's all i have for you guys uh that's it this has been really really, really good conversation good guys fun, appreciate huh? you yeah. all coming together for this one um yeah uh i don't know maybe we'll do this again i'm doing uh george's show tomorrow friday still yeah 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 tomorrow uh, but, um, live or is it going to be uh recorded one that you publish later 
recorded. Just okay, so it's the, recorded. So you'll see the live one later then. But um, me and John from Modern Life Dating are gonna come and muck up the uh, chat for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's recording. You won't be able to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Thanks for hopping on, guys. Um, make sure you follow Aaron Cleary on YouTube, Rolo Tomasi, and of course George Gammon. You can find them all on their own respective YouTube channels. I want to thank you guys for chiming in and uh, creating so much value for guys watching today. Thanks very much. This has been yeah. great. Thanks, thanks for having me. me.